Good morning. And good morning and welcome to the 2022 PBS Customer Forum. My name is Stuart Burns and I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the PBS Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Engagement. First, I want to acknowledge that this Zoom is being recorded. We intend to post these sessions recordings to the GSA website after the forum is concluded. You should see a pop-up window announcing the recording of this session. It is great to be back here in a virtual space with PBS customers from across the country. We have hundreds of attendees with us today from dozens of agencies and bureaus, each with a unique mission. But we are gathered here today as colleagues in federal real estate facing similar challenges and opportunities. And hopefully over the next three days, you'll learn about some of the valuable tools, resources, and information you need to capitalize on these opportunities. Our theme this year is focus for the future, and we have designed an agenda that will help us all achieve our short and long-term space planning needs, as well as address many of the current administration's ambitious goals for sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility. In a few moments, we'll hear from our PBS Commissioner, Nina Albert, who will set the stage by sharing GSA's and PBS's strategic goals. Following that, I will moderate a panel with three GSA leaders to discuss the organization-wide effort it takes to plan and execute new and hybrid workspaces. Then we'll hear from federal agencies currently planning their new workplaces, and they will share their experiences, successes, and challenges. We have two sessions tomorrow, the first focusing on new and innovative workplace resources from our Center for Workplace Strategy team, and the second focusing on all aspects of electric vehicles, including their procurement, charging stations, and utility infrastructure. On Thursday, we'll begin with an overview of three digital project management essentials for PBS customers, and we'll conclude with a panel of public and private sector stakeholders discussing building diversity, infusing cultural diversity into project plans for the public. Before we start today, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes. We have automatically muted your audio to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. And as you know, we are using the FedRAMP compliant Zoom for Government platform for today's session. We have found the Zoom for Government platform to be intuitive and user-friendly. You can customize your experience with the different pods as you wish, or just maximize the viewing area. We will be relying on two different Zoom pods today, chat and Q&A. Please use the chat pod for any administrative questions you have or to report technical issues, and one of our forum team members can assist you. We encourage you to submit questions to our speakers during their presentations, and please do so by using the Q&A pod. We have subject matter experts monitoring the Q&A pod who can address your question on the spot or direct them to the most appropriate speaker. Finally, live captioning is available for this session. You can either use it in the, in the window in Zoom capturing by selecting the more button on your Zoom menu and selecting view subtitles. Or you can use the link we'll provide in the chat pane and you can open a companion window to view the captions side by side with your Zoom screen. Okay, administrative issues behind us, it's now time to start the forum. And there's no more appropriate person to kick us off than our PBS Commissioner, Nina Albert. As PBS Commissioner, Nina manages the nationwide asset management, design, construction, leasing, building management, and disposal of approximately 371 million square feet of government owned and leased space across the United States and in our six territories. Nina brings 20 years of experience in public real estate disposition, public private partnership negotiations, economic revitalization, and sustainable design developments to GSA. She most recently served as Vice President of Real Estate and Parking at the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA where she managed a multi-billion dollar real estate portfolio. While working at the District Department of Environment, Nina led the design and development of a first of its kind $250 million energy efficiency financing program targeting commercial and multifamily property owners. 
As the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative Manager, she oversaw a $1.3 billion redevelopment project in Washington, D.C., including a 2,800-acre waterfront revitalization program. A military veteran, Nina served as the first lieutenant and company executive officer of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Welcome, Nina Albert. Thank you, Stuart. And um, your uh, summary of my bio reminds me that um, uh, I should probably create a short version of that because I'm not sure <laughs> um, I've had such a, uh, an, a, a lengthy introduction, but thank you. Um, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the PBS Customer Forum. Um, this is uh, an incredible opportunity where we can bring together the professionals who are responsible for designing, planning, and managing agency real estate decisions together uh, to participate in discussions that you guys are all facing, we're all facing, um, about uh, the workplace, about uh, real estate issues, uh, whether they be uh, how to manage through uh, this time of uncertainty, um, about how to define what we think might come next. And then ultimately, uh, how do we manage uh, any of us at any scale uh, assets that might be currently underutilized? Um, so anyway, these are the issues that we, we are struggling with in government and uh, this session and series of sessions for the next couple of days are the perfect place to have those candid and hard conversations. Today's theme is to focus for the future and it's about the future of federal work and how best to meet the needs, not just of the future workforce, but how can we enhance mission delivery and improve customer service to the American people through our real estate strategies? This is one of my favorite topics because I believe we have a unique opportunity right now to harness the interest that people who are non-real estate professionals have in real estate. Uh, this interest in general is opening the door to how we talk about uh, managing real estate. And I believe that uh, your colleagues who are non-real estate professionals are looking to you. They're looking to us uh, in the buildings industry to uh, provide a vision uh, for where this can go. So before I put out our vision for modernizing and optimizing federal real estate, I wanna contextualize why I think it's so important for this community to embrace the goals of modernizing and optimizing federal workplaces. As we know, there are significant macro forces impacting all of us at the individual level, at the agency level, at the national level, and frankly, at a global level. So the trends of our time that I'm gonna sort of share my top five, um, we know are going to be lasting. And uh, the real estate portfolios uh, that all of us manage can help respond to them. Um, so first, uh, first and foremost on everybody's mind is a post COVID world. How is telework and hybrid work uh, going to change um, the workplace? Well, I think many of us now know that employees want flexibility in where they work. Uh, and so to provide that, we need to really focus on um, how to create what I call a frictionless or a seamless experience when people transition from being on site in a um, federal facility to offsite. Um, and so in order to be able to do that, folks need to have access to the best technology available. Um, this issue is impacting all employers, both private and public. And so as real estate professionals, this unique moment allows us to learn and partner with private industry and share with them what we're learning because it's a dialogue and a topic that everyone's trying to get their arms around. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity to rethink how we engage, how we share information uh, with our colleagues across the industry. Another macro trend that we cannot keep, uh, that, that, that all of us now have to truly start to understand is how evolving technology, including artificial intelligence is providing an opportunity to push human work up the value scale. What I mean by that is 
as more robotic process automation, RPAs, um, or artificial intelligence and other things start to, you know, just even basic computer functions, um, start to uh, be able to do um, uh, a more um, uh, sort of able to take on systemized work or more automatic work, that means that now our workforce has the opportunity to allow computers to pick up that rote work and we can evolve in our work into uh, what I call higher value work. Um, so that's something that's happening all over the globe. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about is not just the impact of technology on our workforce, but also on mission delivery. Uh, many agencies, many of you, uh, are delivering your mission slightly differently now because you've adopted technology. The other thing is that we're also providing customer service a little bit differently now because of technology. Um, so those are questions of our day, which are how is technology fundamentally changing how we perform our work, where we perform our work, um, and how we can improve the experience uh, for customers. Another macro trend is uh, social justice and the demands uh, on government for increased transparency, equity, and inclusion. And I know that you're gonna be talking uh, over the, the course of this forum about that, but boiling down to the essence, our stakeholders, uh, both the American public, uh, but other uh, folks in industry and um, our contractors want more access to information. They want easier and more transparent access to government data, activities, policies, and how our decisions and our work is impacting equity throughout society. So that's, uh, I don't believe, a trend that's gonna change. Climate change is another element where the personal, societal, and geopolitical impacts uh, are having a, uh, uh, an impact on the decisions that we're making today. So we have to think about managing our portfolios, assuming climate risk increasing. And then lastly, I would be irresponsible not to mention cost escalation and um, managing around supply, supply chain issues. Uh, we all need to now do more uh, with less, or at least within the same budget that we were provided for initially. So the question is how to do that. And I think that internally PBS is looking at how will our approach to project delivery change given the fact that we're being asked to do more with less. It's a complex question, particularly given government's approach to project funding, but we want to and need to partner with you on these issues. So that's the complexity of today. And so the question is, how does our business of designing, delivering, and managing real estate respond to these trends? So I like to break it down into three basic pillars. First and foremost, we need to be designing for people. That is that our federal workplaces have to be offering employees as well as the visiting public the most positive experience that they can. Um, so I had mentioned uh, that seamless or frictionless experience from onsite to offsite, that's one component of it. But the other aspects of it is that when people are in our buildings, they need to feel safe, physically safe, um, safe from uh, cyber uh, intrusions um, and breaches. They also need to feel healthy. And that's something that we're learning more and more as to how important it is that our uh, air quality, ventilation systems, uh, even access to natural daylight, which is an age old premise around sustainability. All of those things are part of the healthy and wellness equation. And so those elements are becoming increasingly important as we design for people going forward. As real estate professionals, we need to drive the portfolio. So what does that mean? It doesn't necessarily mean reduce the footprint or freeze the footprint. However, I'm going to lie if I did not think that we have an opportunity to reduce our footprint and in that process consolidate uh, our real estate interests, whether they're leased or owned, into existing owned assets or to be willing to dispose of owned assets 
that uh, are too difficult financially to manage uh, you know, for the future. So this is not only the sustainable approach, um, both financially, but also um, environmentally, that when we reuse existing buildings and building materials, we will be saving taxpayer money, we will be saving our agencies money, and this is ultimately our shared goal. And then lastly, the last pillar, so we had design for people, we had drive the portfolio, and then the last one is deliver performance. And this is where I see um, both that mention of accomplishing more without being provided additional budget comes into play. How are we gonna reform? How are we gonna improve? How are we gonna modernize our project delivery um, systems? But it's also around the performance of the building. How are we gonna achieve net zero operations? And that's where GSA is spending a tremendous amount of time uh, identifying strategies for existing buildings, for new leases, as well as for new construction and major renovation. Because by 2045, we want to achieve net zero operations throughout our portfolio. And we seek to partner with you on all of these things, driving, designing for people, driving the portfolio and delivering performance. So all of those activities together is what gets us to what I believe can be and should be a modernized and optimized real estate portfolio. I wanna just say one thing. Uh, we have, uh, GSA does as an agency priority goal to work with all CFO Act agencies on your national portfolio plans. And our goal is to get to that by the end of 2023. You may be asking yourselves, how do we put together a portfolio plan in, in the next 18 months when we don't necessarily know how many people are gonna be coming back or exactly what utilization is gonna look like? What I wanna tell you is it's most important actually to uh, approach national portfolio plans from an agency strategy perspective. What are the key strategies that your agency is undertaking to, um, uh, to address uh, the workforce, meaning attraction and retention goals, meaning flexibility goals. Also, what is your agency doing uh, in terms of um, adopting technology uh, to improve mission delivery or to improve customer service? Um, all of those types of things are the questions that we're trying to capture in the national portfolio plans. And we're also rolling out a space estimation tool, because our goal is not to have you lock in a number of how much you're going to reduce or an ultimate utilization rate. What we're trying to do is have you set the goalposts, think through these issues and say, on an aggressive um, spectrum, we think that our uh, portfolio might look like this. On a more conservative uh, approach, we think our portfolio might look like that. Set that range of expectation, and that will be the most important piece to helping your agency uh, determine how it wants to move forward in the future. So we're not trying to lock anybody into a specific utilization rate or a determination about exactly how hybrid work is going to affect your agency. What we're trying to do is have you think through the strategic questions that might impact your real estate portfolio. And then we have tools that they'll talk about, uh, I think over the next three days here, so that you can start to think about establishing some primary real estate strategies and a range for how uh, you might um, approach your portfolio going forward. So uh, with that, I just wanna welcome all of you to this uh, forum. Uh, we work with a whole variety of customers, large and small. And I'll just say whether or not uh, you uh, manage millions of square feet or tens of thousands of square feet, it's all incredibly important to have you here um, learning, asking questions, sharing your experiences so that we can all learn from each other. Uh, we are all facing similar paths going forward these challenges and macro trends that I just uh, started my comments with uh, are things that we're all experiencing. And then the world of the unknown is there. And during that time, uh, our agency colleagues are looking to us 
uh, to provide some clarity, to provide some focus and provide some direction, which is why uh, I believe that this conversation at this time is so important. I'm grateful to the organizers of the forum uh, for all the work that you've done uh, to pull this together. It is a tremendous agenda. Uh, it aligns uh, very squarely with my priorities, with GSA's priorities, and most importantly, it directly supports the administration's goals and objectives. So thank you for uh, inviting me to speak, Stuart. Now let's get to the panels and the discussions um, so we can start sharing insights with each other. Thank you so much. Nina, thank you. Um, that really was a, a great stage setting for what we're going to be talking about over the next three, day, three days. So I appreciate you joining. Um, and that brings us to our first conversation of the day, focus for the future, a vision of the new federal workplace. Um, now evolving from a more traditional work environment to a hybrid model or to any version of the office that the future holds is not something that real estate professionals can do in a vacuum. We all know that. The emerging shape of the federal workplace will be driven by space, by technology, and by personnel management. And with that in mind, we have with us today three GSA leaders in those three areas of space, technology, and personnel. Tracy Demartini is GSA's Chief Human Capital Officer. In her role, leading the Office of Human Resources Management, Tracy leads HR support activities for the 12,000 employees of the agency. She is responsible for GSA-wide policy and oversight of all aspects of human capital management, including talent acquisition, development and sustainment, labor and employee relations, performance management, compensation, strategic workforce and succession planning, executive resources, diversity management, and data analytics. Chuck Hardy is PBS's acting chief architect, but many of you may also know him as the chief workplace officer. As the agency's lead executive in charge of workplace strategy, Chuck heads efforts across the country with support in vital areas such as design and construction, real estate services, and procurement. He's responsible for research and development in the delivery of innovative workplace solutions throughout the federal government. And finally, Dave Shive is GSA's chief information officer and oversees GSA IT and information technology operations and budget ensuring that it's aligned with agency and administration strategic objectives and priorities. Dave joined GSA in 2012. Prior to that, being named CIO, uh, he was the director of the Office of Enterprise Infrastructure, responsible for enterprise information technology infrastructure platforms and capabilities that support GSA business enterprise. He was also the acting director of HR and FM systems for GSA CFO, and the CPO offices. So welcome Tracy, Chuck, and Dave, and thank you for joining us today. What I'd like to do is start with Chuck. Uh, so Chuck, can you, can you tell us what are some of the key areas of focus that your office has sort of zeroed in on in real time uh, to provide the greatest value to our clients? Sure, and thanks for having, uh, having me in talking about, I think what is a very pertinent uh, topic at these times. Uh, we really are in a in a once in a lifetime and uh, opportunity here to uh, retool the workforce and align it with how we're doing work. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the entire federal population has kind of upskilled their distributed work capabilities, and what we're looking now to is how do you operationalize that and how do you put that into a sustainable kind of. Uh, solution and as Nina noted. We're looking to modernize and optimize the federal government in ways the workplace can support. Uh, what we're focused on is flexibility, that seamless on-site, off-site experience with this technology, technology enabled, has universal design principles incorporated into it. Uh, it's healthy. We've got air quality, temperature, natural light, socially connected, ergonomic, all those kind of things being brought together uh, that become embedded in the solution. Uh, so the focus on that is really strong. Uh, we've spent the last couple of years really focused on task management. We didn't miss a beat in delivering mission. And we now, as we move forward and operationalize this, we really got to focus on uh, cultural management as well of, of how, do, how do we work as a team as a, and as a, as a group. 
Uh, sustainability, uh, that's another one that's top, top on our list of, of a focus around workplace is the energy and water efficiency, the net zero operations, the climate resiliency, the workplace resiliency to make sure that we can keep going where we go. And, and uh, again, on top of everybody's list of safety, the, the physical security of space, the secure access, cybersecurity, redundant operations, being able to make sure uh, we can keep going anytime, anywhere. All that leads from that modernization to the optimized footprint, which gets to mission delivery. It's results driven. It's productive. We get the job done. Uh, it's a better use of our assets. And it starts to retool the workplace ecosystem, which is that balance between headquarters, regional presence, and distributed work. And how do you make that work in an integrated fashion together to, to move forward? And ultimately, as, as Nina noted, and as uh, we've seen in the past, is it becomes cost efficient. Uh, the life cycle uh, based return on this really saves money and it right sizes your operations in a way that makes sense for, for you and the taxpayer. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Thanks, Chuck. Um, you know, we're all struggling with, uh, with how to think this through. And I think one of the interesting uh, one of the interesting things that we've learned through our outreach is that uh, nobody's got it all figured out just yet. So that's sort of a good news, bad news scenario. Good news is we're not in it alone. The bad news is um, nobody's figured this out. So we're all sort of uh, waiting to step out here. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the products um, and solutions that we have available for customers that are in the Zoom today uh, that might be able to come to GSA and maybe leverage some contracts that we have available to us? Sure, we we got a lot going on. A lot of lot uh, of our solutions will be coming live this summer and this fall, uh, and we've got a lot of uh, contracts in place with workplace strategists that can also bring uh, support to your operations and ours. Uh, one is uh, home office solutions, and this starts to tap into uh, that that combination of hybrid work and, and how do we do work better as we move forward and making sure people have the tools. So we're working with our partners in the Federal Acquisition Service uh, to come up with a easy, an easy button to, to set up home office solutions as you, your agencies determine appropriate uh, for your operation. So it's not, a, it's not a prescriptive thing, this is what you do, but it's an, it's an easy way to reach out and buy the things and get them to the places they need for productive home office solutions. Uh, we're also looking at, we've got an IDIQ with five vendors right now in private sector co-work locations. We also are looking at uh, internal federal co-working locations and what that looks like. So you can get on-demand space uh, for your surge needs, uh, for uh, ad hoc actions, and for all those other kind of opportunities that you don't want to carry space 365 days, you can bring it on as needed. And so we're trying to line up more opportunities around that. Um, we have a workplace innovation lab that's going to be coming live this, this fall. And that's where we're trying out a lot of these technologies. Uh, we're going to have a workplace uh, support app that is hopefully available across government so people can book the space, come in and use it, provide feedback on that space. And the furniture and the technology that we'll have operating in that innovation lab will be for you all to try out offer recommendations and improve as we move forward. So uh, you can come there for an hour or for a week. You can bring one or a team and sit down and use it. Uh, the first year, we're kind of offering that as free to our customers to come in and use and give us that feedback. And so we really want to encourage people to start seeing how those kind of operations can work. And it's a blend between not only the innovation lab, but the flex hub that I just mentioned, because uh, one example would be if you had a meeting over at OMB, which is a couple blocks from our building, you could come over to the innovation lab, sit down in a conference room, have your pre-meet there, and then walk over to your OMB meeting, and then come back to the innovation lab, sit down and have a pre-brief or post-brief, and then go home from that location and never have to go to uh, your home office at all. So it's those kind of things that are, we're thinking are going to drive the future location and things like that. And then the other one that Nina noted was uh, we have a new tool coming forward and this will be available in a couple of weeks. It's called the Workplace Investment Feasibility Model. This is a uh, version two from what our previous version was, but it allows you to start doing scenario-based uh, planning on office-based solutions, uh, remote work, telework, all those kind of things that 
factor into the strategies that you come up with. Uh, you're going to get a briefing on it later this week, so you get to see some of the details. I won't go too deep. But one thing we're learning and thinking about is this isn't a one size, one solution, one time fits all anymore. And so when you talk about scenario planning, it might not be what's a low risk and what's a high risk scenario. It may be what's our operation during, and I'll just throw out hurricane season versus in non-hurricane season. Do we have a surge in operations? Do we need more space? What does that look like? And what are some of the solutions out there? So all these tools kind of combine and integrate into giving you uh, an effective toolkit to put together the right solution for your strategies. And we've got the workplace strategists, uh, 12, right now 12 uh, AE contracts that you can tap into uh, to help get you there too from a design standpoint, but then also leveraging our tools. So that's it right now. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Um, just because I'm super excited to see this innovation lab myself, um, I did want to do one more plug for that. Um, it's at 1800, it will be at 1800 F Street. Um, we're reserving 25,000 square feet um, in that building for our innovation lab. And I really would encourage you if you're in the DC area, uh, or even if you're just visiting in the DC area uh, and would like to have a place to drop in and work for all or part of a day or all or part of a week, um, please, when, when it's out and offered fully, uh, take advantage of it. We, we do want to think more globally about how we would implement a solution like this. And we want to get our technology and our, uh, and our furniture and our arrangement of that space uh, right so that we can replicate it across the country. So thanks for that, Chuck. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break here and shift over to Dave Shive um, to talk a little bit more about the, the technology solutions. Um, so how, do, how does your office integrate with PBS, with our office, uh, to provide sort of a holistic workplace solution um, for our clients? Thanks, Stuart. Um, and so I'll start by saying super excited uh, to be a part of this conversation. I've been uh, excited for the last couple of weeks to, to talk with our PBS partners. And, uh, and so thanks for having me to be a part of the conversation. I'll break the response down into two different places. Um, so we're a traditional IT shop and we support the business of PBS uh, in their important mission. So we provide laptops and cell phones and we provide wireless in, you know, in facilities and we provide applications that help them manage the real estate portfolio and to do design and construction activities and, and things like that. In that regard, um, we major on the major and we minor on the minor. If we are poor at doing that job in supporting PBS, then PBS is a less functional, less capable organization. So that's kind of the the overarching piece, we work very closely with them to make sure they have the right technologies and the right um, physical space, including wireless and things like that, so that they can be a high performing, high functioning organization. Um, but that leads into the second part of my conversation. Um, because we are a traditional IT shop providing technology to PBS the business, um, we also use ourselves as a proving ground to see what's possible. One of the things that I say to, to my team and to partners, uh, GSA partners across the board is we don't do to our customers what we haven't tried out on ourselves first. Um, so when we're talking about things like an innovation lab that we work in close partnership with PBS to stand up uh, the enabling technology in that innovation lab, we've actually piloted some of that stuff on ourselves previously. We've found out what provides outcomes, uh, good outcomes and what doesn't provide good outcomes. And so then we expose those good outcome opportunities out to um, you all, our, our um, agency partners, um, to say, we're not just trying things out on you. We've actually tried it out on, our, on ourselves and we're only asking uh, in partnership with you to work on us with things that we found have provided some value. And that uh, spans any number of um, infrastructures. Um, you know, that includes um, supporting infrastructure like data circuits and wireless and things like that, applications that are in use that, that a prospective partner might use when they come in. Do they have access to email? Can they access email, uh, their corporate or their agency email when they're in a GSA facility? Can, will their VPN work and stuff? We're working all of that out so that your people, when they 
use our facilities, especially in a place like an innovation lab, they have a seamless, um, seamless integration and seamless um, uh, work effort. We also uh, work very closely with PBS, um, again, using ourselves as a proven ground to say what's emerging, what's coming down the road. When the pandemic first started, uh, we were fortunate. We had um, mobile enabled the GSA workforce five or six years ago. So the pivot to working in a hybrid or a remote environment wasn't too terribly difficult for us. Um, but what we were able to do is start to anticipate what the future of digital work was gonna look like after, um, after the pandemic. Nina mentioned at the top of the discussion that um, that we, the federal enterprise, have learned some things. We've uh, developed some maturity in, uh, in how to work in a hybrid or remote environment. Um, and the expectations of our workforce and those who consume space and technology um, doing the work of government have naturally risen. And we have an obligation as a providing community um, to meet those raised expectations. And so we've been looking at what does the future of digital work look like? What does the future of federal work look like? Um, and that is a combination of space and technology and human capital um, issues like how do people work in that new space? And so we support PBS by looking down the road and assessing what those new business processes are, what those new technologies are, um, and trying them out on ourselves before we would ever think of um, uh, sharing that as a product or capability out to our customers. Thanks, Dave, and, I, and I'd like to I'd like to also thank you for um, having us positioned to be able to to do that pivot, as you mentioned in in March of twenty twenty. Um, it really was seamless from my perspective, and and never before had had I realized the importance of uh, you know the, your IT infrastructure. Uh, being an enabler to us getting our job done. I mean, I mean the, the sheer fact that we can host a forum uh, over the next several days with hundreds of people uh, around the country and multiple uh, bureaus um, is, a, I, I guess, a testament to how we developed and, and really got better at this uh, over the past two years. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, if I can shift over to Tracy for just a minute, um, as, as I mentioned, there are these three components, the real estate uh, structure that we're trying, you know, the physical environment that we're trying to provide for when people do come into the environment, into the office, the technology solutions that we use in a hybrid or a virtual, uh, a more virtual um, uh, environment is, is also extremely important, but so is the human capital management. So Tracy, could you talk a little bit about um, innovative management practices or tools that we've adopted internally here that you might recommend for our customers? Sure, absolutely. And thanks, Stuart, for inviting me to sit in on this panel. It's always so good to be with you and Chuck and Dave. And so we can share with our customers across the government all the exciting things we're doing at GSA. As Dave said, we don't do anything with our customers unless we do the proof of concept on ourselves. We call ourselves a living lab of government to see what might work and how we can be innovative. And that not only includes technology and space, but also human capital. So much like um, how Dave was able to position us well on how to work in a hybrid or remote environment, our human capital policies are flexible enough to kind of push the envelope and see what will it take to transform the federal government into a more hybrid or remote employer of choice. Just want to kind of pause here a second and say, I recognize this is not easy. I think it was Stuart that also mentioned a few minutes ago, more than anything, this is a change management issue, right? This is changing how the government fundamentally does business. And we hear all of the news stories percolating about how we're in a war for talent and how we have to stay competitive and how employees are very, um, very firm on how they want to work. After two years of basically working from their homes, the question has to be, why do they need to come into the office? So when you take the field trip that Stuart invited you to take to 1800F to see our innovation space, I encourage you to bring your chief human capital officers or HR officers with you because they're gonna be right by your side negotiating with the labor unions on how the space will impact labor agreements they're gonna be able to articulate to managers and to employees how this collaborative workspace will help 
keep people at the forefront when they're in the office to do good things, such as training our new federal workforce that is coming in, allowing them to have more cross-cutting conversations with other parts of your agency and within GSA, and really getting people used to a new way of doing business when they come into the office. So at GSA, we're doing a variety of things in human capital um, that are exciting and we're happy to talk to your offices about. But I also wanna make sure you know, we are already partnering with your Chico offices to share this information. In fact, after I leave today's panel, I'll be going to a Chico call where one of Chuck's staff is presenting on tools uh, to the Chicos about looking how we measure space management because we know these conversations have to happen now and we have to be ready to make some hard decisions about how much space we need, where people are gonna work, how they're gonna work and really work on the change management piece. So Chuck, thank you for letting me work with your team twice in one day, it is a privilege. <clears throat> Some of the things we're doing at GSA include looking at our positions and deciding what positions have to be in the office, think building managers or people that work in a SCIF, and perhaps other positions that could be geographically located in an area that serves customers or in a certain region such as the DMV, maybe their headquarter jobs. And then our third category is what are those positions? Now remember, it's positions, not people that could be fully remote. We're looking at it not as only as a way for us to conserve space and to use space more efficiently and productively, but also how we stay competitive as an employer of choice. So a few minutes ago, I already said, we're not only competing with talent for the private sector, we're competing with talent across the government. You know, GSA used to have a real competitive edge because we really leaned heavily into telework and remote work. And now all of the other CFO Act agencies and small agencies are doing the same. So where I used to be able to amply steal top acquisition and IT talent from more conservative agencies that wanted people in five days a week, y'all are taking away my good recruiting tool of federal employees. So we have to figure out how to make this work. So it is um, something that anyone that's coming into the federal space understands they will have as a, as a right and as a privilege to work in a more hybrid environment while keeping an eye on the mission. We're also really spending a lot of time having change management conversations across all levels. First, it does start with managers and supervisors. One thing I observed these last two years is we haven't paid enough attention to the direction the care and the training we give to new supervisors and even more um, seasoned ones. We have to give them the support and the tools they need to manage a hybrid workforce. We also have to give them more support in how they are gonna manage performance um, for their teams because gone are the days where you would just rely on seeing who's in the office. That's not a measure of productivity anymore. We have to get serious about aligning our performance plans with meaningful work, supporting the mission and goals of the agency. And so it doesn't matter where an individual is working, it matters what they are producing, what goals they're achieving and how they're supporting the overall agency and our customers and our partners. This is, sounds like it should be relatively easy, but the one thing I can remind everyone is government never really did performance management very well. Something we've always struggled with. So I think this is gonna give us a really interesting opportunity to try and improve upon it and figuring out ways um, to devise what that looks like. So not only can we measure performance and discuss it with our stakeholders, such as Congress or the IG or GAO, but our employees understand what is expected of them. Because this is not only change management for managers, it is for employees too. And as we move out of the pandemic into the new future stage of work, we have to remind employees that we want to be as flexible as possible because we want to be an employer of choice, but we also all are very focused on getting the work of our agencies done. Sometimes for some categories of employees, depending on their job and what they do, it might mean having to come into the office for a few days a week. And when they do, what experience can they expect? Nina spoke very well about all of the great things we have to think about. And she was so, um, so dead on correct about what the employees are gonna be looking for. If we're going to make them commute into office spaces, we need to give them a space that is comfortable, that is safe, 
that is conducive to the work they're going to be doing, whether it is meeting with customers or meeting with colleagues to have collaborative meetings, or perhaps using a SCIF if they're doing work that is confidential and requires such a space. So we are doing a lot of that at GSA right now in a variety of ways. And we also have taken the additional step of bringing in more talent to help that actually has experience in this um, area to help us tell the story. So right now in my HR space, I have brought in an expert that'll be with me for the next one, possibly two years to talk about how we measure success of the hybrid workforce. And he has the experience already in work he's done with the state of California, where they have set up dashboards to talk about how letting people work from home actually increases trust in government because you're allowing people to stay in their communities. You're making government more accessible through increased technology and access to services um, via the web and computers, and also just retaining top talent who want these flexibilities. So before I turn it back to Stuart, I'll just do another plea that if you have not already done so, please talk to your Chicos, bring them into the conversations with you because all the great stuff that Chuck is doing when he talks about workspace planning, your Chicos are doing with workforce planning and where there is one, there has to be the other. So we look forward to supporting our partners in PBS and we're always happy to take questions from our agency partners to see what is possible. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Tracy. Um, you know, you, you bring up a good point that, um, you know, I've always compared the, the space, the space requirements are sort of the, the caboose on the train. It's really HR policy and tech enabled that allow us to do the things that ultimately end up with a real estate impact. Um, and so, you know, having the engine of your Chico and your CIO involved in the conversation will help you inform your real estate solution. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, you know, Chuck, I, I don't wanna make it seem like GSA or PBS has it all figured out. And I know you work with a lot of clients uh, across the government. Um, what are you learning from the experience of working with those clients that's helping you develop and deploy and improve upon the solutions that we're recommending to our customers? A great question. and. Uh... My, my favorite uh, quote recently, or probably misquote, is uh, Neil Young paraphrasing Chopin, who said, I never created anything, I just remember things differently. And when you think about workplace, that's kind of where we're at, is uh, remembering differently a little bit on how we reassemble some of the kit of parts that, that go into workplace. Uh, as you see the group here of CIO and HR and, and, and design all on the same, same panel, that's really one of the differences where we have to be integrated in this conversation. Um, I just got back from Neocon, which is a annual furniture show, and it all looks the same. All, a lot of the pieces are the same, but you're seeing subtle differences in some of them. So you're starting to see acoustics being addressed because when we go back to the office, uh, there's going to be more hybrid calls and there's going to be more people having hybrid calls in the office. So how do you do that acoustically? that makes it effective. So people don't say, I'm not going back in because I can't have a call, even though I wanna go back in. So those are some of the subtle things we have to do. Um, the other thing I'm seeing, and this is uh, probably no comfort to anyone, there isn't an answer out there. Uh, from talking to other governments, uh, Canada, Finland, uh, South Korea, and others, uh, there, they, it's, it's almost like a deja vu of conversation. Everybody's got the same issues out there. They're trying to solve the thing, saying, and they're looking to somebody else for an answer, saying, well, what are you doing? What, what, how do I do this? How do I fix this? Uh, one thing is certain across the board is we have to become more agile and flexible in our solutions. Uh, there's Moore's Law in IT where it says technology basically uh, develops every two years uh, on, a, on a path. I think workspace and, and policies and, and HR issues are going to be the same way. It's going to be a much more um, uh, agile and developmental world and no longer a set somebody in place for 10 years and come back and, and, and see how they're doing kind of thing. It's going to be a constant uh, management. And so agencies are looking to that to figure out how do I do that with the tools I have? How do I do that with the, the, the space I have? How do I do it with the policies I have? Uh, and we're seeing different, different solutions and it has to be specific to the operation. And so just as, as we talk about GSA is, 
as leading in certain ways. When we did our kind of analysis of what's the difference between a regional office and a central office, you start looking at functionalities. You start looking at who are they dealing with. You start looking at not only the work styles of what do they need to get their work done, the types of places, but you look at the work patterns, where, who, who and where are they de going and dealing with. So the work styles and work patterns, as you'll hear in the tool that Tracy's going to see after this meeting, and you're going to hear later in the, in, the, in the conference, we start to come out of that with our best guess at ratios of space types and setups that will respond to uh, what we believe to be the intended strategy and the operations that, that, the, that you as customers are looking for. Uh, and that's, that's really, uh, again, uniform across the board is every client is coming with the same kind of questions with just a little different twist. And we got to make sure that we're parent tailing our solutions to, to make sure that we're addressing that and that we're listening. So lead with listening, uh, co-create the solutions with our clients because uh, it's not just home or the office, it's home, the office, a flex hub, a car. There's so many places people are working now and we have to be open to figuring out how do you blend that into a solution. So I, I think the, the biggest thing we're hearing is folks want to come back to the office. They want to interact. They need face-to-face. -face. They want to know what, what that looks like. We're kind of struggling with that ourselves and how do you curate a proper experience? We want to make sure that we can articulate the value of a commute, what's going to cause me to get out of my home and get on a train or a car or, or walk to anywhere else. Other than that, what's the value of that uh, and the interactions you get and, and all those kind of things uh, are uniform across the board. So uh, it's, it's some exciting times. Uh, we're going to be trying some things, as you just heard on some of our tools and actions. And, and we're going to be learning from that. And that's going to be a process. It's going to be a six month, 12 month process to say, okay, now let's make sure that we adjust these and not just accept them because we guessed wrong. So anyway, thanks. George. Thanks. I, I think that's an important point to, uh, to recognize that we're, nobody's going to get this right, right out of the gate. Um, we're going to have to remain uh, agile. I do, uh, speaking of being agile, I did see a question pop into the <laughs> pop into the uh, Zoom pod there um, about uh, making our our Flex Hub uh, at GSA headquarters uh, available for people to virtually tour. And I think the answer to that is yes. But I didn't want to speak for you, Chuck. But I think once it's up and set up, which we're looking for uh, this fall. Um, we'd like to be able to not only show it off live, but uh, show it off virtually so people can get an idea of what we're talking about here. And That's correct. Solutions. Yes. Thanks. Um, speaking of, uh, of cutting edge, um, if I could turn back to Dave uh, for a minute on the IT side, what trends are you seeing in industry that are shaping some of the solutions and policies uh, around IT that we're using here at GSA? Uh, thanks, Stuart. And I appreciate the question because it allows me to be the nerd that I really am. So bear with me. I will try to speak in plain language as I get through some of this stuff. Um, so we're seeing a few things. Uh, we're seeing uh, deep and meaningful automations. You know, we've been automating through tech, using technology for decades now, but the, the velocity and the quality of those automations is skyrocketing as we um, develop systems that are deeply interconnected through APIs and um, people are scripting the work that they would normally manually do every single day themselves and letting um, silicone do the work rather than you know, warm bodies do the work and um, doing things like robotics um, so that we take those manual tasks that people do and series of tasks and string them together um, so that uh, people can turn their work to higher value work you know, knowledge worker of the 21st century type of work rather than rote, manual, bureaucratic work um, going on. Um, you know, we are looking and using deeply augmentations like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, these are allowing us to continue to transform how we use technology. Te technology is not static, nor is business here in the 21st century. Um, and we're allowing, um, the machines that work alongside us to take a look at our actions and learn from that over time and, uh, and then uh, perform those repeatable tasks themselves. Um, we are uh, looking at simple things like, you know, everybody loves Alexa and Siri and stuff like that. 
we're finding ways for um, our partners and GSA employees to interact with um, with their systems in ways that look and feel like that, you know, kind of like that Star Trek vision where you say, computer, I want this, or please do that. Um, we're really there now and, uh, and, and maturing that process. Um, we're looking at ways uh, to give people what they want faster. Um, so what we're finding is that the workforce uh, here in government here in the 21st century has a fair amount of technical acumen and, uh, and while they do like to call a help desk or have a technician show up at their desk to fix a particular thing, 90% of the time, what they want to do is go look online, ask a question, get an answer and fix it themselves in, in 30 seconds rather than waiting for a call back or spending time on a help desk. So we're creating mechanisms for people to rapidly get access to actionable information to do things, whether that thing is fixing a technology piece or working on say a building automation um, system. You know, one of the things I say is um, that those in this business, everybody who can hear my voice right now, um, you are one of the three original internets of things, you know, battle space management run in DOD, the remote sensing environment run by, um, uh, by Department of Commerce, NOAA, um, and building automation systems, that internet of things. Those are the three oldest internets of things uh, working in government. And because this industry was a first mover in that internet of things space, um, you incurred some technical debt at a higher velocity than more of the modern like um, house automation type internets of things that, that have um, grown up out of a lot of the work that you did in this space over the last uh, 20 or so years. Um, so we're looking at overlaying some deep and meaningful security on top of that so that people can feel confident with the data that's coming off of that internet of things, but also so that we can use that data in the highest value way, using those automations and augmentations that I talked about a few minutes ago and making it so that, say, a facility manager has access to real-time data to make good decisions to make sure the facility is operating as well as it possibly can, as an example. We're doing some deep and meaningful um, work in environmental and occupancy sensor technology so that we don't just know who's in the building, but what their usage patterns are as they move about the building so that we can, in going back to that agility that um, Chuck was talking about, so that we can reform and restru restructure space um, in real time or near real time um, in response to how people are actually using facilities. Um, we're looking at that building system performance data that comes off of all of this internet of things and um, not just reacting and responding to that data, but using predictive analytics to say, where can we see things before they're gonna be a problem? Where can we jump on them so that that air conditioner does not go down or so that that pump flow meter that's measuring sewage going in and out of a facility um, so we can jump on that before it goes down. I guess sewage should only go out of the facility. I should clarify that. Um, and, uh, and then we're also taking a look at the, the technology world, which has done a good job of securing information technology, your laptops and your cell phones, and looking at the, the right ways to overlay that on these non-IT technologies that we call it operational technology you know, a sensor that's sitting, controlling your lights in your facility or something like that, making sure that it has the right cybersecurity controls um, there um, that you do on your information technology assets so that we as a community can feel confident that not only is the thing gonna work, but it's not gonna be accessible by say nation state actors and do nefarious things on there. And then the very last thing is um, we're spending a lot of time in big data and analytics to make sure that we're not only gathering this tidal wave of data, but we can actually do something with it so that PBS can not only support facilities more effectively on behalf of our partners, you all, um, but so that you all can have access to the information you need to generate and co-create along with us the best workplace environments for the, um, for the future workforce that we're all gonna be managing. Thanks for the question, Stuart. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I want to take advantage of the fact that we, because uh, we'll have a lot of real estate, we're going to be, real estate issues we're going to be talking about over the next several days, but I want to take advantage of the fact that we have both you and Tracy here um, to talk about uh, this new hybrid work environment. Um, we, 
one of the one of the most important things that uh, I discussed with my staff, many of which were were remote for a long time, uh, was how much more included they felt as we left the office. Uh, those of us who were in the office, as we left our traditional office and went completely virtual, now coming back from a hundred percent virtual into a hybrid environment, how do we build an inclusive environment so that both um, people that are choosing to go back to the office or have to go back to the office and those people who want to remain remote, um, how do we cr create opportunities either through technology or HR policy to, to, be, to, to maintain that inclusive environment that we, that we were working in over the past several years? And either Tracy or Dave or Chuck, if you've got ideas on that too. I'll be happy to start because I love this topic because it really is forcing us how to do things differently and be more creative and not just fall back onto the status quo of everyone filing into a conference room. And if we have people in a regional office throwing them up on our screen and everyone using a spider phone to talk, that is antiquated and not going to happen anymore. To your point, Stuart, I also heard feedback from my staff about how much more included they felt when everyone was doing a Zoom meeting or we use Google Hangouts or Microsoft Teams because there wasn't a differentiation whether you were a headquarters staff or a regional staff or a remote worker or teleworking. Everyone was on a screen, it was a level playing field. And the only thing I really had to juggle was reminding myself not to set 9 a.m. meetings because my West Coast employees did not like that 6 a.m. wake up call. What, what, what that all comes down to is it's about being intentional. So for example, it is a combination of technology and not human capital policy. I call it human capital intuition or that emotional intelligence side that we all have to develop as supervisors and employees. So for example, we use right now a spider and Dave can talk more with, no, not a spider, an owl. I'm getting my animals confused. But the owl is a more intuitive piece of technology that does a 360 video of the room. So it looks like you're actually there. It has enhanced audio to help people hear speakers more clearly. And the first time um, we, we deployed the owl at GSA, it was a disaster. And it was not at all because of the technology. The technology worked beautifully. It was the people because we still were falling into bad habits of cross-talking in a room and not being inclusive of, of those that were not in the room. Um, so that just alerted to me these more change management types of trainings we have to enforce to make sure people are being very intentional about their communications. The second piece of it is, is being really intentional about when you bring people together. I think I terrify everyone because I am so passionate about a more enhanced remote hybrid workforce. They think I never want to have my employees come together. That could not be further from the truth. I want to make sure when I bring my employees to DC or when I travel to a region, it's going to be the best use of our time and our travel dollars. What exactly are we going to be doing? What's the objective of the meeting? If I'm meeting with my customers, will they be there and do we have an intentional reason to actually physically get together in space. And I think that's what people want most of all is to know that there's a clear reason to come together and there's also the ability to be more flexible. You talked also a lot about equity and inclusion and that also comes down to who we're able to recruit for future jobs. I think having a more hybrid presence means we're gonna be able to include people from all parts of the country which should enhance our ability to recruit the top talent that we need for government jobs and also be inclusive of all segments of the population. What does that mean? Specifically people with targeted disabilities, people that may not be able to come into a work site or it's a very big struggle for them, but they can absolutely do their work from home with no problem. When I was the Chico at EEOC, we did run a pilot where we took a lot of employees, new employees to us that were on full-time social security disability benefits. They lived, have, tend to live in rural areas where there were limited job opportunities and we were able to enhance and use them in our call centers. So we were giving them meaningful work and taking away the barriers of them having to physically go into a location if that was their choice and if that was able, they were able to do that. So we have to just be very intentional and creative. And I think Dave put it in, in the chat, I saw it. We have to be agile. The government's not been very good about being agile. We're very risk averse. 
And I think what we all need to realize is we have the ability to do what needs to be done. We just have to be willing to take the risk. And when it doesn't work, just to fix it. You know, there's going to be times where we realize that doesn't work in a hybrid environment that calls for an in-person meeting or vice versa and not be afraid to course correct. Um, it's going to be a really interesting time over the next year. And Chuck said it best when he reminded us, no one else has figured this out either. He's absolutely right. State and local governments are wrestling with it. Other countries are wrestling with it. What we don't wanna do is be so daunted by the challenge that we do nothing and easily fall back into the five days a week in the office because that's not going to help us. This is the time to seize and to figure out how we can do it right. And with that is gonna come a need for more investments in things like technology, more things like training, which have, are sometimes the after effect things that people think are you know, nice to haves. They really are mandatory if we're going to evolve the workforce into a more hybrid presence. Dave, anything um, to add from a technology perspective? Sure, sure. So. Um, Tracy hit on this a little bit as, as we saw the pandemic winding down and we started to take a look at what does the future of digital work here uh, look like for GSA and for the larger federal enterprise, um, we took a look at the, the needs, the evolving needs of those kind of 21st century knowledge workers and we were surprised. Um, this goes back to that um, notion that we don't, try, we don't do to our customers what we haven't tried out ourselves. When people started coming back in the GSA facilities, we found that even though we had decent conference room technology, that people dialing in from home would dial in from home, uh, but people in our facilities would go back to their workspaces and, um, and dial into meetings rather than co-locating and self-collecting into conference rooms. And so we started asking, uh, generating feedback on why that was. And we found that People felt when they were attending these meetings that when they had a camera staring at the back of their head and half of the people in that conference room were represented by the back of their head, um, they didn't feel heard. They didn't feel listened to. Um, they didn't feel that they had access to those nonverbal co communication um, instances that are so important when you're reading a room. And that over the last couple of years, people have become very comfortable with reading those cues and hearing what people are saying and kind of what they're not saying when they're looking at each other on a screen. And they're trying to self-generate that capability by going back to their desk and dialing into meetings from there. And that allowed us to look at technologies that would provide a 360 degree view or 180 degree view to make sure the sound was there so that people could participate participate in meetings, look at a presentation, interact with one another, but also see those social cues that are so critically important in being able to read a room as either you're presenting or um, participating in. Um, so we've been looking at those kind of technologies, technologies that are sensitive to things like black and brown skin tones, you know, and we'll try something out and we'll see these uh, these tools do a very good, a poor job of, of resolving that. So we'll either work with the vendors to resolve that or focus on vendors that can actually provide that. So we're constantly learning and iterating. And I'll give you a, one perfect example. So we have a program where we try to recruit cybersecurity talent from um, historically black uh, colleges and universities. And um, we found that the HBCUs that were located in cities like um, Morgan State up in Baltimore, they were having a lot of success attracting people in um, from those people into the cybersecurity realm. But HBCUs, which are not located in cities like Grambling and uh, organizations, which far outnumber those that are in cities, um, we're having a really difficult time. Um, and the reason was, is because those people had no interest in moving to Washington, D.C. or moving to a city. They wanted to stay where they were, where they were born, where they were raised, where they went to university. Um, but the government was not very good about providing a workspace for them to work. When we talk instead about how GSA, uh, GSA operates, we say we work in a fully remote environment. We're sensitive to inclusive issues. Um, and you can do that work from the deep south or from inner city Los Angeles or from Baltimore or wherever you're um, working from, um, that you're gonna have an equitable 
work experience using technology and space intertwined together and with policy that's a wrapper around all of that, um, the numbers jumped because people are like, you hear me, you see me, you recognize me for where I am. Um, and you've provided a workspace for me to be my a best version of myself. That's what inclusiveness is all about here in, um, in the workspace. Thank you for that. And then thank, thanks for that very specific example. I think that, that brings some of this stuff home for people. Um, so I'm doing a quick time check here. We only have a couple minutes left. I did see some questions and comments coming into the Q&A, um, some of which we answered online. Some of them are, are comments that we'll take under uh, consideration. I thought really good one about net zero buildings, which we may be covering um, uh, in a little more specificity in an upcoming session. Um, I did want to uh, pose this one question, and I, and I don't know whether it's a, it may be for Tracy, uh, maybe for anybody, I'll just open it one up. One of my favorites, Stuart, about the camera. Yeah, so the question is, for the benefit of, of those uh, who are just listening in, how do you fully utilize these technologies when people, when employees are not required to turn on cameras and therefore or are not seen or seemingly present during those meetings. And that's an HR uh, policy slash uh, challenge, I think, right? It's a policy, it's a training question, it's an expectations question, it is a cultural change management question all wrapped into one. So my first question back to, the, um, to our, our partner that asked it is, who said you don't have to require it? Um, one of the things that's in a great book I recently read, there's a couple of really good books out about distributed teams, but it's about creating team agreements um, and understanding when will it be required to have a camera on or when will you be um, okay if someone's just in listening mode. So for example, in a large town hall setting, you really don't, do you really need to have everyone on camera? I mean, that sounds a little bit autocratic and hand, heavy handed, but maybe for a smaller team meeting, yes, because you wanna pick up on those cues and everything that David said, we're still working. This is still an expectation to be professional and comport yourself in a way. So you're going to have to set those expectations out and also talk and train to your employees, but also your managers. And this is another part that's exciting to me. You know, it shouldn't just be management solely by preference, meaning I want everyone to be on camera and fully dressed in business wear to work at all times. I think we can do this um, in a way that is respectful of all employees by explaining to them work is still work. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, some of the flexibilities that we had, such as maybe working split shifts or being more forgiving when your cat you know, photo bombs you during a Zoom meeting, we might need to roll back a little bit, but we can still be flexible. And I have high expectations that all adults work for the federal government. There may be a handful that want to test that theory, but I think all people are looking for is clear guidance and expectation. So there is no need or understanding that you can never do any of this with a remote or hybrid workforce. What we have to do first is have the conversations up front in many cases, that's gonna mean partnering with our labor unions so they understand what the expectations are and making sure that these rules and these expectations are applied fairly across all agencies or all parts of an agency. Um, it really just comes down to having good communication, a good training strategy and explaining to people what the needs are and why they are important to adhere to. Will this be perfect? No. Will you still have union grievances and complaints? Yes. And my response to that is, that's what happens when you're a supervisor. You're expected to manage and to learn to manage and to lean into it. And your, your HR offices will be giving you that support and training as, we, as this evolves and we lean heavily into it. Going back to something David said, this is what we're hoping to model for the rest of the workforce at GSA. We're learning as we go too. And there are definitely some areas where we need to beef up our training and coaching of managers and reset expectations for our employees. It will not be easy, but it will be worth it because this is the direction we're going in and we have to make sure we're not afraid to lean into it. Thanks for that, uh, Tracy. Um, I, I do think it's it's a challenge and it's a concern of many. Um, so I appreciate you, you acknowledging uh, paths forward on that. Um, we are at time, and I want to be mindful of time. I, I, I want to thank, first of all, Tracy, Chuck, Dave, um, 
for a very engaging conversation. Um, we are going to take a, a quick break to let everybody stretch, get something to drink. The one thing that I learned over the past two years is, um, uh, I think Dave shared this with me pretty early on, you know, telework is not so much working from home, it's living at work. Um, and when you're living at work, um, which I'm doing today, uh, you, you do need to get up and stretch and, and grab a drink of water or whatever. Um, so I, I, the one thing that I hope everyone leaves this session with and, and why we wanted to kick it off with this is the importance of engaging with your, um, your human capital officer and your CIO because the solutions that we provide for our agencies, ourselves included, um, can't be done in a vacuum. You can't just deliver a real estate solution and not think through the implications to HR policy and the, and the IT technology that you're gonna to need to do that. Um, likewise, your chief human capital officers and your CIOs should not be planning um, new policies and new technologies and the use of that without understanding the real estate impacts that will be coming downstream. So um, I would encourage everybody to connect with your, with your Chico and your CIO um, make sure that you're having those conversations about where you're headed with your agency moving forward. I uh, want to thank you for, uh, for the time. Thanks again to the panel. Um, Jonathan McIntyre will be back uh, in the next session starting promptly at 1130. That's planning for the future, a conversation on space planning with our PBS customers. So a little more targeted on the space planning side for our next session beginning at 1130. Thank you very much for my panelists and everybody who joined this morning. Well, good morning and welcome back to the PBS Customer Forum. Uh, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Jonathan McIntyre. I'm a senior architect, certified planner and workplace strategist in GSA's Center for Workplace Strategy. I'll be your moderator today for this panel. Um, but also I'm kind of wearing a second hat and will also be a participant um, as well. Um, if you all are joining us uh, for the first time this morning, I just wanted to give you the heads up that we are recording our sessions and just wanted to give you that uh, point. Um, earlier today, uh, my GSA colleague spoke about the full team effort that it's that is taking to transition into our new uh, and different workplace uh, realm that we're experiencing right now. Um, our most sig uh, significant panel of the day might be this one coming up because we're flipping the tables and actually hearing from some of our PBS customers who are representing various agencies of different sizes and missions. Um, they're currently undergoing their own future workplace transformation and engagements as well. And we're really happy to have them here with us today and very eager to hear about their efforts from their perspective, um, lessons learned and any best practices. So without further ado, let me introduce our, our panel as quickly as, as I can. First, we have um, Dr. Tony Bennett. He's, Tony is currently serves at the USAID Chief of Headquarters Management Division. And his responsibilities include real, real and personal property management for USAID's Washington locations, as well as oversight of emergency management, safety, facilities, operations, and local transportation. Second, I'd like to introduce Bill Cords. Bill has served as the Director of Infrastructure at NAVAIR, the Navy Air Systems Command at Pax River in Southern Maryland. Um, he's been developing and operating a research and aviation, uh, excuse me, Pax River is actually um, a research and aviation facilities um, base, and he's been involved with the program since November 2008. Bill is a retired captain of the U.S. Navy Civil Engineer Corps, and Bill has over 30 years of experience leading infrastructure development and operations worldwide. David Pacuar is a real property director in the Office of Chief Readiness Support Officer for the Department of Homeland Security's OCRSO's Real Property Office. He oversees a portfolio of assets um, and span, that spans over 100 million square feet of building space, 90,000 acres of land, 
and 40,000 structures. That's pretty amazing. Uh, the portfolio is that the DHS portfolio is valued at about 35 million and has an average annual budget for acquisitions, improvements, sustainment, and disposals of $5 billion. In his role, David is responsible for department real property strategy, policy, compliance, and the advancement of cross-component collaboration through strategic planning. Next, we have Rob D'Onofrio. He is the workplace strategy lead also in the Department of Homeland Security's Office of the Chief Readiness Support Officer. In this capacity, Rob manages planning efforts and in, in developing a strategic framework to help reimagine workspace solutions towards a more cost-effective and adaptable model while considering the post-pandemic implications. This effort will guide DHS um, towards portfolio optimization and define DHS's workplace of the future. Rob provides DHS enterprise-wide real property program management. He, he focuses in on improving efficiencies and effectiveness of the national portfolio with an inventory of 110 million square feet and a program spend of roughly $5 billion. Again, pretty impressive. So now turning the tables, representing GSA Public Building Service, we have Nadia Scarlett. She's currently serving as the Capital Projects Division Director in the Office of Design and Construction for GSA's National Capital Region. The Capital Projects Division is primarily responsible for planning, design, construction, and project management, and turnover of projects about, above the prospectus level for GSA-owned buildings. We especially are happy to have Nadia with us this morning since she was the project manager for the USAID project that Tony is affiliated with. And final, but not least, is myself. I'm joining this discussion as well. I'm in the Center for Workplace Strategy. I help lead a wide range of customized workplace engagement with numerous federal agencies spanning from the Department of Defense to the Peace Corps. Uh, I also have participated in a variety of workplace initiatives such as the upcoming Workplace Innovation Lab. And I'm also involved with the Law Enforcement Community of Practice. Um, I'm joining today's um, group as well as I was the project lead for the numerous NAVAIR headquarters workplace engagements and design efforts with Bill Cords. So those are the links and the bios. So let's get started with our panel. For context, I'd first like to have a sort of a round robin with our key panelists and was wondering if each of you would be able to briefly describe your workplace efforts that you're currently working on. So I think I'll pass the ball to Tony first with uh, USAID. Tony? Well, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, for USAID, um, our planning began pre-COVID. In fact, I believe it began in about 2015. Uh, so this was something that we have been on a journey with uh, almost, uh, almost seven years and we have about uh, three to four more years left in this renovation process. Uh, but our initial goal was to reduce our footprint. We were in seven different buildings. We wanted to get to a two headquarter solution uh, within the district. And uh, we were able to achieve that uh, in two, uh, two phases. The first phase where I stand now, I'm at the 500 uh, D Street Southwest, uh, where the first tenant of this 12 uh, story building and it was, this was a great project uh, because we were able to design it ourselves. Uh, our, our design, our concept, our layout. Um, as I stand here at my office, I'm at a um, standing desk. Every station here has a, a fully uh, articulating standing desk that goes up and down. Uh, many other uh, ergonomic uh, features. And we also want to improve our utilization of space and as I mentioned before, the ergonomics, the wellness, making sure that we're modernized to be able to, uh, at this point, we are uh, state of the art, but we want to at least be modern and, and relevant the next so many years. And then we also want to reduce costs associated with our operations of multiple locations to include not only the rent, but the security, the IT maintenance, shuttles, and things like that. So I'm just so happy that uh, to be with you just to share about uh, 
what we've experienced and how we can uh, share information with one another. Thank you. That's great. Um, Bill, can you uh, chime us in on um, what's happening at NAVAIR? Okay. Um, we're a headquarters organization located down at Pax River, and we have um, you know, roughly a 6,000 person headquarters campus. We've got a combination of, of business professionals and program management offices that uh, perform the acquisition and R&D for Naval Air Weapon Systems. And we've got two very different kinds of um, uh, buildings. We've got a relatively modern um, headquarters building. It's a five-story, 467,000 square foot uh, building that's called the IPT building, the Integrated Product Team building. So this has like a central core and some wide open floor plates um, to work with. And then we have this smattering of, of um, both temporary and, and World War II infrastructure that are essentially conversions uh, being used as, as office buildings. And we started this journey about, you know, in earnest about five years ago, and it actually preceded that just with um, continuing challenges and supporting the dynamics of the organization with its space resources and, and then growth of our, of our organization. And um, about five years ago, we entered into this partnership with um, GSA and AECOM in um, our first pilot, which was centered around one of our program management teams. And this pilot was, you know, solving a space challenge that this organization had for about a decade, just with continuing growth and then applying the um, more smaller cubes to solve their challenges and just the, um, the challenges with such approach and meeting um, the program office's need. And we had a um, pretty innovative um, leader there that was open to new ideas and the facilities team was you know, advancing concepts in, in hoteling and alternative um, seating models for about a decade. And then he saw the, um, the value, if you will, with um, uh, this kind of uh, effort in a hybrid work environment and stood up to be our first pilot. And about five years ago, we started that and um, worked with the AECOM and creating a, a new operating environment for them and a hoteling framework. And um, that was a, a very successful project. We had to utilize a, a research and development network because at the time our information technology with the Navy infrastructure and the Naval Marine Corps internet, the um, corporate solution for the Navy didn't have the capabilities. So this was kind of preceding all this infrastructure upgrades and network upgrades of recent with the, uh, the COVID environment. Um, so this first pilot was very successful. Um, it was relatively small, around 13,000 square feet and um, accommodated a program team. And then our second pilot was in the, the post-COVID, um, was in the COVID, post-COVID environment with um, some pretty significant infrastructure upgrades Navy-wide and implementation of Office 365 that gave us a lot of um, corporate IT to leverage and, and then a willingness of, of another organization on the business side of the house um, to pilot our second one. And this was with our procurement group. And we did a, um, a pilot that's just finishing up right now um, for our contracting organization. And um, that one also was uh, about the same size. Um, um, but a very different uh, work environment with the, the business side with a more highly distributed um, workforce by design. And then some organizational learning that we had with the, um, our first pilot. So this one um, I'll say is orders of magnitude of improvement over and above our first pilot. And it was just in, you know, the various changes in operating distributedly, you know, since the pandemic, where as an organization, we really learned and, and then maturing our approach with GSA and AECOM, you know, finished our, our second pilot. So we're really focused on our headquarters building, focused on the headquarters organization. And now with these two pilots of representative groups of our, our organization, uh, we're in the process of, of designing and um, implementing the um, 
the remainder of the, the consolidation efforts in our headquarters building. So we envision that to be this um, three to five year project. We're kind of structuring now how we would go about doing that with um, the funding side of it and then the design side of it. Um, so we're, you know, well on our way and um, we're, um, you know, shedding some of that World War II infrastructure already. We've shed some leases already and um, we're really focused on our headquarters building and, and completing that and then continuing this effort throughout the organization and the remainder of the footprints. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I wanted to pass the ball over to DHS with David and Rob. I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of an overview of your workplace efforts right now. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and yeah. let uh, Rob take this. All right. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John Jonathan. Uh, glad to be here today with the uh, with the other panelists. Um, so at DHS, we really have a number of planning efforts in motion being worked uh, out at the field with our components as well as at the department level. Um, much of much of this coming out of the, the PMA requirements to uh, define a new vision uh, for use of federal real estate as well as our, our secretary's uh, infrastructure transformation priorities uh, at the department level. Um, what my group is doing now at headquarters is, is to de develop a workplace strategy um, by taking a step back to look across a number of past planning efforts we've conducted uh, to pull out some of the best practices going back uh, over 10 years now and to establish some of the guide rails for, for what's achievable given the mission constraints and then uh, look at post pandemic impacts on the workforce and space functions to then uh, be more forward leaning and innovative uh, in reimagining the workplace of the future at DHS. Um, and we're going about this by building a, a very data-driven approach uh, to really understand utilization uh, for both administrative as well as mission spaces and uh, work through some leasing scenarios and financial analysis to look at how we can achieve some of our mid and long-term goals. Um, and ultimately we wanna leverage the strategy we're developing to uh, mature the department policies on workspace and uh, deliver a more flexible and adaptable work environment uh, that's, that's both cost effective and improves on uh, delivery of uh, the DHS mission. So we plan to finalize this strategy uh, at the end of 2022. Um, also, I think it's really important to acknowledge here that this uh, type of enterprise-wide planning can't happen in a vacuum, certainly. And, and so we're spending a lot of time building that team of stakeholders, uh, both internally across our various uh, lines of business, as well as externally with, with GSA and OMB. Um, and then our, our leadership is bringing these conversations to the forefront um, and representing not only our voice, but the voice of other agencies to, to the President's Management and Council um, to socialize these, these challenges and best practices government-wide. Um, so that's a bit of a high-level overview um, about our current strategy. Uh, we'll get into some of that uh, a little bit further. Um, the bottom line, we're, we're taking a holistic approach across the department to look at uh, optimizing our portfolio um, and that it's not a one size fits all, which I think others have alluded to here today. Um, so we're really developing a collaborative effort uh, to understand the programmatic needs and uh, taking a, a mission first approach. Hey, thanks, Rob. Appreciate that overview. Um, I was going to pass the ball to Bill and Navair. I just was curious how how did you achieve your you know organizational buy in at Navair for change? Because um, I know from my my experience with working with you and Navair, you know where you were before and where you are are now and where you're headed are very very different. And I was just wondering again how you were you know, how did, how did we get the buy-in from your perspective? What were the best um, kind of routes to get to that point? Okay, um, so space resources and um, I call it our space challenge over the last decade and a half, you know, it's kind of always been this constant source of friction in the organization, a constant source of, of I'll call it distraction with, you know, the, um, 
the, the leadership involvement with regards to the governance and, and changing and accommodating growth and, and then applying the legacy model with, you know, the standard, I mean, we had some pretty well-developed standards for our, 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 you know, offices, our conference rooms and our cubes and, and just, um, I'll call it a constant source of friction and, um, things taking a long time and um, never really solving, you know, kind of the core organizational problem with the dynamic and or dynamic nature of our organization and constantly um, changing and evolving and in many instances growing to support new mission needs. So, you know, being a research and development and acquisition command, we've had, you know, strong, you know, front office commitment on driving the organization performance and, and being open and certainly um, evaluative of innovation and, and new ideas and, um, you know, senior leaders support on, you know, piloting and trying new things. And I think that was, you know, the, the um, you know, support from the top, so to speak, with being open to new ideas and performance models. And then, you know, we had the um, customer, as I mentioned, um, one of our program management officers that over the years we had worked with them and probably, ex and we exhausted, you know, essentially the legacy solution to their problem. And we couldn't build more smaller cubes for him to solve his organizational growth. And, um, and um, you know, he was very open to trying something completely different. We were looking for a partner under our strategic initiatives for a new workplace design, a workplace of the future. And he quickly volunteered himself on behalf of the organization to move forward as our first pilot. You know, we'd done previous efforts in this area and it was really just in limited instances apart from our organization where we had conference rooms or common spaces. And, you know, the organization was open to applying those kind of away from the core, you know, organizational support, but he was the, the first one to stand up realizing that the old way of doing things wasn't going to work. So, you know, we implemented some um, temporary personnel authorities with our HR team, the digital team, like I indicated, leveraged a research and development network that had a lot more capability with respect to tools and mobility um, that the standard Navy solution didn't offer. And we partnered with the GSA, with the AECOM team on a lot of upfront efforts on understanding the nature of our work and the nature of our needs, and then creating this, this kit of parts and a solution that was um, going to meet the, the office's needs and, and then completely, you know, re-envision what the workplace was with this you know, six or seven variant kit of parts, you know, versus our standard cube, you know, conference room and office model. So that's, you know, that was um, successful. It was innovative. It generated a lot of interest across our entire organization. You know, people were curious what they were up to and what they were doing. And, and then, you know, some of the workplace flexibilities um, you know, really changed a lot of people's lives for the better on in um, productivity enhancements, you know, productivity satisfaction. So there was a lot of, you know, initial excitement, interest, and then, um, you know, meaningful outcomes of this first pilot that, that really kind of sparked an interest in the, in the command for it. So you know, with that, and then combination with the the pandemic, and then having um, you know Navy infrastructure laid down where the IT was was corporate, and we were in the maxi flex environment. You know, we had other leaders um, stand up to become the second pilot, and at that time, you know, our front office saw that culturally, you know, we were ready. We had some broad based interest and support across. The organization and there was a, a development of you know I'll call it a, a governance process that brought governance up for space resources and this initiative really right up to the front office and up to 
executive leadership in the command where um, it was now, you know, being adopted command-wide corporately with, with the leaders based on, you know, not only the success of, of their piloting, but also just the necessity to be ready and, and move forward with a, a post-COVID operating environment. So it was kind of a combination of, you know, readiness of the digital, the HR and facilities functional teams um, together with, um, I'll call it a program management element. There was a task force that was initiated in the command and then really driven from top leadership into the organization down to um, adapt and, and implement. Great, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to <clears throat> just see if Tony or Nadia had anything that they could add to kind of those thoughts about, you know, how you got buy-in, organizational or executive buy-in and what was done at USAID. Yeah, the buy-in uh, depends on who's, who's feeling the benefit of the buy-in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what has helped, and I have to, I have to credit uh, GSA with this, is uh, the model that was set up at 18 and F you know, word got out that, you know, we want to be uh, modern. We want to be uh, up to speed with whatever else is going on because our, our original headquarters, and I didn't talk about it much, but at uh, 1300 Pennsylvania Avenue, we were first tenant over there as well. So the office looks, uh, the unrenovated areas look just like it did in 1995, 96 timeframe. Um, so getting the buy-in, you know, I, People are interviewing in those places. They see, you know, the conditions. They see the worn out carpet. They see the, the old fabric uh, cubicles. They see a lot of that stuff. And that really helped get the buy-in. In fact, people walk in and say, well, this, this place looks sad. Uh, this place looks, you know. So that really started getting the buy-in because some people would, you know, leave, go to other agencies that have better looking offices. And then some would come to us and say, wow, I thought you guys had it uh, a little better than, looks nice on the outside, but the inside doesn't look so, you know, modern. And uh, we were able to get the buy-in. And of course, uh, trying to um, get the funding and support, that was the biggest buy-in, getting that. Uh, but we got that. And then of course, once we got the buy-in, the budget, the authority to do so, then the change management became the biggest uh, challenge because we had to convince people, especially those with the 200 square foot, 200 plus square foot uh, private offices, uh, those seniors who have a private conference room and you know all the technologies of the day. And uh, also in the people who had uh, pretty large cubicles that, that were gonna go down to you know, 64 square feet for a cubicle and uh, 100 square feet for a private office, including SESs you know, who are normally used to having an outer office. So that was the biggest hurdle. Uh, but again, we do thank uh, GSA for being that model and, and helping us convince people that this is the way we're to go. And, and I don't want to thank God for COVID, but I do appreciate the way that we adapted with COVID because people now realize that I don't need all that stuff to get my job done, that I could be more flexible, more agile, and, and just really change the way I do business. So I really appreciate you know, all these factors coming together. I think it's always helped us become where we become what we wanted to become, uh, more agile, more cost-effective, more uh, modern uh, organization. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Appreciate it. I just uh, add, Jonathan, that uh -huh. just jumping in, um, piggybacking off of Tony, a good model that was used for USA was the uh, pallet. They had a mobility design lab pallet uh, constructed in 2010 Time frame with the uh, utilizing GSA's total workplace model. Um, one of the first agencies to actually really implement that, it was 27,000 square feet of space on the seventh floor at the Ronald Reagan building. Um, and it was out of our um, OPDQ office. So that model uh, also had a lot of buy-in after it was constructed, right? Uh, uh, even other agencies started coming over to USA to tour the place. Um, and we finished the pilot out um, with the second half of the seventh floor, which also had SCIF space, uh, operations center, state-of-the-art operations center, and um, 
all types of classified and non-classified space in an open environment. But to be able to show that entire seven floor and how that model worked, I think it 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 helped with the buy-in for USAID um, as an organizational structure. So I did just want to add that model that was utilized. Well, Nadia, I was one of the people that uh, brought other agencies through, and I I used it as a tool. Uh, to, you know, I take them on a tour of 1800F, but then I would take them over to USAID because you were you were you know we were the 2012 model. You guys were a little bit beyond 2012, you know, with, with the look and feel. So I uh, just want to let you know, thanks to USAID, that really helped, helped yeah. other agencies. So appreciate that. Yeah, I do have to caution though, that pilot now, you know, we have Old Town uh, USA, and then we have New Town USA, and then we have this pilot phase. So we may <laughs> have to do a light refresh of the pilot in 2025. So just, just caution you on that. If you're going to do a pilot, make sure you got a plan for, you know, additional phase or a touch-up phase after you do all your phase renovations. All right. Next, I wanted to circle back with David and Rob. Just was curious if um, you could talk to us a little bit about the tools and the solutions or resources that you all are using to get where you want to be and uh, pass it over to you. Great, thanks for, thanks for the question, Jonathan. Um, so just, just a little bit of context, uh, so the audience kind of understands a little bit about our, our initiative and the way that we're approaching this. Um, so for the Department of Homeland Security, our office really focuses on strategy, policy, oversight, and coordination. Um, so. The, the tools and resources are really going to come in um, and focus a lot on the, on the policies that we have. Um, our 12 senior real property officers, they do um, the execution, they do the life cycle delivery um, on our portfolio, and it's a fairly large portfolio. Our overall approach is mission first. That, that absolutely has to get done. Um, we've got roughly 250,000 employees. Um, and we need to ensure that they are very well positioned to deliver that, um, that mission capability. Um, so we're, we know that we're not strictly talking about just reducing the footprint, but we know that we have an opportunity to look at other tools and look at the mission delivery as more of an ecosystem, look outside of the traditional uh, four walls. So which I'm sure is no surprise to anyone um, our senior real property officer, Tom Chalecki, really focuses on affordable readiness. So balancing what the needs are um, with resources while delivering the mission. Um, generally, when we think like solutions, I, I gotta you know state that we don't have a solution. You know, I don't I don't know if anybody has that solution, and if they do, please call me. Um, we are. <laughs> obviously working through this. We've been proactively working on um, understanding what are some of the lessons learned uh, for, for some time now. But one of the big things that has been very helpful for us from a solutions perspective is, um, is, is leadership. Our leadership has really stepped up. They've recognized that it's a unique opportunity now. Um, and they've, put out guidance, they put it in black and white that our secretary has specific priorities for transformation of the workspace. Um, so that is definitely a tool that I think has been um, very um, useful in terms of, you know, the leadership is, is, is key here. And I think what is recognized is, is that by impacting the workspace, we can hit on a lot of those other things that the secretary is interested in. Um, including workforce morale, budget, resilience, and, and so on. Um, and also from a leadership perspective, again, Tom, our senior real property officer, is, is um, focused on this. It is a strategic priority. So it's a, a lot of time, a lot of uh, focus and energy goes on here. Um, and another, when it comes to the solution, again, I will, I will say that we are not there. Um, the initiative that um, Rob is leading um, is 
really focusing on understanding. And I think what's what's great is the perspective that we had with the session earlier of like HR, technology, IT. I mean, that is really what we're trying to materialize. Um, so we've partnered with them. So um, I would say our tool is really this initiative um, and we're partnering like with the different CXOs. Um, obviously our components, the information that we get from the components, they do the work, they've got great ideas and we're looking to um, leverage those and apply them. Um, we're also bringing in um, you know, top consultants. We're bringing in um, analyzing technology capabilities, getting access to information, really focusing on an approach, kind of an HR approach of looking at our staff from a perspective of communities of practice, which I think you may also hear like work patterns, you know, typical administrative folks, those will have certain expectations, but our legal folks need different requirements. Our law enforcement folks, they're out in the field in their cars, et cetera. They have different uh, type of um, requirements. Some other tools, again, again, policy um, and compliance with the department's policy. So really looking at metrics, looking at utilization rates, looking at resource allocation, et cetera. And then the last one you had mentioned was on resourcing. Um, this is obviously the hot topic. Um, resources are tight and it is difficult to get resources, especially when you're trying to do a transformational type of an activity for an entire portfolio. Um, and you're competing against, you know, beds and, and, you know, things of that nature, that is definitely a difficult thing. And again, I think that's where the leadership support has been very instrumental for us. Um, our leadership does recognize that we need to make the in upfront investments in order to get the life cycle um, cost savings, as well as deliver workspaces that um, are more effective. Um, and maybe they're not actually workspaces, but they're part of that ecosystem. Um, and uh, the, so, so the resources, a lot, of, a lot of work left to be done there. Um, but we're just focusing on making sure we've got a plan, let the plan is transparent and we can communicate that to our leadership um, and including um, OMB and Congress that um, there is an opportunity here and if resourced appropriately, we can um, deliver more effective workspace solutions. Okay, Rob, do you have anything you'd like to add? I have something I wanna add, <laughs> but I'll do that after you. No, I'm good on that one, Jonathan, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to applaud DHS for the, um, I guess it was through your field efficiencies efforts, but you all produced this incredible video of um, the art of the possible of what your future could look like, uh, not only in the workplace, but just the vision of consolidation and kind of shared space with your multiple, you know, uh, you know, components that are oftentimes all in the same city, but they're currently maybe in separate locations. And I just thought the video was a fantastic tool to kind of illustrate, again, the art of the possible. I, I don't know if you have anything that you all want to kind of chime in on. Yeah, and I think that that really comes down to change management. It, it, and I think we talked about that earlier. I mean, it's any kind of change is difficult. Everybody in general will be resistant to that. And getting folks to visualize and actually see that this is possible. And I think the video is a great example. I think another, you know, is actually going to spaces um, where the mission is effectively delivered. Again, our concentration heavily on law enforcement. And that is, that's number one. We cannot not deliver that mission, but actually talking about to those that have gone through those types of um, renovations and actually sees that the actual mission can be delivered and be delivered more effectively. That is, I think, key to uh, change management. Great. Um, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit. Um... Tony, we might be rehashing here a little bit, but I wanted, again, just for, for our audience sake, um, to get a little bit of an idea of when did USAID begin planning changes, you know, to your transformable, you know, changes to, to your workplace? Was it, sounded like you've, you've been doing it 
over a series of years, but curious mm -hmm. about when you jump started it. Uh, yes, I'd be glad to answer that. So as I mentioned earlier, it, it became a concept in around 2015. And from that, we developed what we call the real estate strategy framework known as the Washington real estate strategy. Uh, the difference between um, my group and other panelists is that we're a 4,000 person headquarters. Uh, so whatever we do, you know, you may be able to borrow some of our ideas, but you may have to scale it up or down to meet meet your needs. Uh, but we developed this framework, which kind of laid out what we wanted to do. And I, I talked about some of these earlier about um, uh, reducing the footprint, um, more ergonomic workstation, more wellness, you know, everything else that deals with the creature comforts. Uh, but then we had architectural studies that we invested in. Uh, we formed uh, tenant rep groups. Uh, we have a, a team called Space Matters, and you can you know, kind of get your own branding, but that space matters kind of uh, held on the last 70 years. And then as uh, Nadia uh, mentioned earlier, we did do pilot phases, uh, which, you know, was a pretty uh, risky investment, but it did set the path forward and we were able to correct course in each of the phases. We were in phase five and six at the same time. We're moving it into seven and eight. Uh, we we're supposed to conclude with phases nine and 10 uh, in 2025. So a lot of different things moving. And uh, uh, the other thing I was going to mention too, we did have uh, an internal team that we had to develop. So I heard a lot about resources, uh, but our agency was very kind uh, to allow us to uh, bring together a team and some tools includes uh, facility management software, being able to uh, track people in digital format versus uh, uh, I used to have to track people by sticky notes and working on Microsoft Visio and PowerPoint, uh, but we have a, a system that really helps track people in real time. Uh, digitization of records, which I know has been mentioned in, in many different uh, sessions. And I just happen to come out of a FOIA and the records background. So I bring that to every project uh, because I realize there's uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet that could be uh, captured and reutilized just by getting rid of all those file cabinets. And then uh, one thing I would also mention too, if, you're, if your agency is able to afford it, I know we heard change management and we did bring aboard a firm, a local Washington firm. And I can tell you, it could be quite expensive. I mean, you can spend it anywhere between 350 a year or, or up to a million a year, depending on how much change management uh, you like to procure. Uh, but then also we're trying to utilize in-house people. So if you have a graphics department, a print shop, uh, you have, uh, you know, people who are now doing these social media studios, you know, you can use those resources as well. And then uh, space planning and design. So we actually have people on staff who are interior designers, uh, some people with architectural background, and these are permanent positions. Hopefully they'll have enough work after the year 2025. Uh, but we found that putting all this together uh, has really helped us. Uh, but we may have to start a GoFundMe page because we do need money for uh, phases nine and 10, which is, you know, everyone's going to have this challenge, I'm sure, in the years to come. Thanks. Great. And I'm well, just going to about GoFundMe, so <laughs> don't call the lawyers. <laughs> I was going to um, kind of piggyback on, too, with Nadia. Um, just was wondering if you could just give us a brief overview of um, you know, how important was it for, for you, for GSA to move the stakeholder base at USAID to move forward? And then um, you know, what was developed for your workplace engagement and the plans? Just, just a quick overview. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, very quickly, I mean, I do believe it's very important to um, build the stakeholder base and engage all stakeholders and unify their understanding of the project, uh, the challenges, uh, accountabilities, and the um, impact that certain decisions and timely performance may have on the um, successful project outcomes. So um, as a project manager in the early phases of the USA um, development, my plan was to develop a um, solution-based uh, proactive project culture across all stakeholders. And we would implement that through various progress meetings um, held weekly with the project stakeholders. Um, 
it's important because it helped to facilitate decision making on open issues, which keeps forward movement on progress on these projects. So over time, we've developed these um, weekly progress meetings with um, key stakeholders. And then we have what we call swim lanes, where we develop the stakeholders from each individual group within, like first you deal with the high level leadership, but then we had individual groups with their CIO team, security team. Now we're getting more deep into the bureaus impacted and who needs to be involved, as well as the contractors um, doing the work. So over time, it has grown into many different um, platforms where we meet from a stakeholder standpoint. Even so with uh, comprehensive um, customer meetings that are collaborative throughout the, um, um, across the business lines here at GSA, where we meet with uh, OPMRE, um, um, Office of Facilities, um, Office, Office of Acquisitions, ODC, Office of Design and Construction, and um, I believe ODC LPMD facilitates those meetings. Um, and we go over the entire portfolio of USAID since we're looking at it holistically and we're talking about what's going on on our projects, but how it impacts it from a facilities, operations and maintenance standpoint, um, the OAs getting billing on board and all of those things. So those collaborative customer meetings um, are very helpful. Um, and I believe it's very important to the success of a project like this. As Tony mentioned, going from um, being in seven different locations in Virginia and DC and um, you know, collaborating into two main location headquarters units, so. Thank you. Um, I, I was gonna chime in and Bill, feel free to jump in here too from from my perspective as a project lead for the NAVAIR workplace engagements, um, it was totally essential for us to, to really be the, the, the kind of curator of the engagement, looking at the different strategies between people, place, and technology. And then also our role, a uh, heavy part of our role is actually to be educators. Um, kind of in a base way, but really to kind of take the stakeholders and leadership and executive leadership through a process. And we have um, GSA's workplace engagement process does that in a variety of um, you know, tools and methods of engaging folks and getting information, getting people to talk and share about um, where they are, where they where they could be and things like that. So that was, you know, the workplace engagement process for us is actually totally based in change management because it, it's really putting people together and coming up with um, customized solutions. And um, that really was essential. And, you know, I'd say Bill and I, you know, as many people that were kind of early adopters and had the vision, there were just as many people that were kicking and screaming because, <laughs> uh, Maybe they didn't quite understand, you know, what was going on, and it was our job to really take them through and to reassure them um, and show them what, you know, the future could be. And frankly, the two pilots that Navair has invested in, uh, that was a really wise investment, Bill, in the sense that those two pilots now are are the catalyst or kind of building the momentum and enthusiasm that is now kind of helping us glide along as we go through uh, programmatic uh, uh, program of requirements investigations and then also doing test fits and schematic design. So I don't know if you have anything else to add, Bill, on that. Just, it was the upfront engagement was um, invaluable. You know, it was, um, it wasn't handholding, it was, um, I'll call it normalizing and building uh, a unified approach to how we were going to go about doing this. Um, you know, there was a lot of um, push to go very quickly and there was a lot of voices in the organization that we should not invest in that time and skip over it and go right to solutions and, um, you know, so that was this um, tension, if you will, within the organization 
Um, but we did invest and we did, you know, take the time and that upfront effort. And, and I always called it a normalization to develop a corporate approach to this and from the business side of the house and the program side of the house and to create, you know, learning in the organization to do it. And, and I think what has happened is, you know, we've, um, we've improved each step of the way and we're improving going forward, but it's going to make all the other efforts um, accelerate and simplify because already we've standardized certain um, elements of design, the elements of the kits apart and, and, and an approach to this where we're not doing that with, um, you know, the entire organization. We did that with selective elements of the organization. The, organi the entire organization in a sense was involved through our governance structures, um, but, but we didn't experiment on a massive project. So it was, um, very wise. It was instrumental in creating a, a, an approach to this that um, is going to be long term and effective. But there was this, you know, this real push to just let's skip over that. We don't have time to do that. Let's just create it, and um, that would have been disastrous. So you know, this was um, some tension with with the GSA AECOM team. It was some internal tension. But I just I just go back to how invaluable that was, and better doing that with representative um, instances of our organization than going through that with the entire organization. So it's going to make everything here ever after easier, um, easier on the organization, easier on the the task force that's been assembled to um, implement this. And we're just um, continuing to learn and evolve and refine. Um, but I think some of the, the bigger elements of, of design have already been solved and in the approach, um, which is very cost effective on our part. And I do go back to our original building, our modern building that we're kind of focusing this effort on and just how we're leveraging that asset for you know our, our solution set. So um i think it was invaluable activity and effort and will forever benefit from that time that we spent up front even though there was some frustration in the organization and the leadership for how how long that was taking but invaluable well and as you've mentioned on a couple occasions too it's it's creating a sustainable sustainable solutions, maybe multiple solutions, design and design solutions. And when we use the term design, we're talking about not only design of space, but design of the technology, design of policies, procedures, operations, you know, everything kind of has to work together. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, Bill and his team have done really well is to remind leadership that, you know, this isn't just a tenant improvement project. This is this is transformational for the organization. It's going to, you know, it's intended to last, you know, whatever, 15 to 30 years. We, we don't know. But the last solution was what is already, what, almost 30 years old. It has okay. left been left untouched and you know we're we're looking at solutions that can adjust themselves over the next 15 to 30 years rather than just be a single fixed solution so i mean i think we were lucky in this i mean from gsa's side of the center for workplace strategy we were working with you know our partners at navair pretty much we all shared the same kind of set of values and and sort of vision and um, while we met some resistance or whatever you want to call it along the way, we stuck our gun, you know, stuck to our guns. And now that these pilots are done, people are seeing as believing, I guess I should say. And so now we've hit some breakthroughs um, and the pandemic helped with those breakthroughs as well. I have to kind of echo what Tony, what you were saying before the pandemic, one of the attributes of the pandemic was opening eyes to new ways of working. So um, just checking our clock right now, we're, we are at 1223 here on the East Coast. So we have about eight minutes left. Um, I kind of wanted to, 
um, turn back to the panelists to kind of just say, if, uh, ask you if you had any closing remarks or thoughts about, you know, um, kind of your, your transformation, any kind of best practices that you would really stand by and um, kind of any, you know, thoughts about where you're headed in the future. I know this is kind of off script here, um, but I just thought it would be really wonderful. And um, Andrea and team in the production room just wanted to double check with you to see if if there are any questions that we should tackle here, just, just give us a shout out. Uh, sure, Jonathan, there is a, uh, there are question in, open question in our Q&A pod. Okay. Uh, question about funding, because uh, everyone talked about how they're re tight resources, like how you were able to make your, you know, your business case. Uh, we had a question about um, digital, tracking systems for employees and services. So a couple of questions in there. Uh, okay. Let me stick them in your script and uh, easier for you to see that way perhaps. That would be great. Um, yeah, so Terrence, um, I know you asked the question about what is your primary funding source. I wasn't sure if you were direct, who you were directing that to or was it for all three agencies on the panel? Just, just you can go off mute, I think, and uh, maybe, or type in additional kind of information in the chat line. Jonathan, I'll, I'll just uh, add a quick one on the, on the funding side. I, 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 funding is absolutely key. That, that is kind of a no brainer. It is a constant challenge. Um, and on our side, we have been focusing first of all at the Department of Transparency um, and ensuring that um, our components have a plan um, for delivering the transformation, being aware of it, and being well positioned to advocate for that. Um, there's constant um, you know, competing priorities. Um, on top of that, what we are looking to advocate for is essentially a transformation, a facility transformation fund. Um, that's definitely a bit difficult to, to get. I mean, fairly similar to what GSA, um, I would say, I think had with the consolidation fund. Uh, so looking at different methodologies to um, ensure that funding is there, um, I will say I don't have a very easy question, very easy answer to that. But um, given the scale of our program, roughly around you know five billion dollars a year for the entire life cycle cost, we know that already we're spending probably somewhere to the tune of five to seven hundred million dollars a year. In, um, in acquisitions and improvements. So really focusing on those projects and leveraging um, projects that are already in motion, but um, it's, it is, it's a difficult question to answer, to say the least. David. Um, Crystal, I see you've added a uh, question in the Q&A line. You were interested in uh, asking the panelists about any digital tracking systems for employees and services. Wasn't sure if at um, NAVAIR or at USAID or even at DHS installations, are you, are you all looking into um, ways in which to track folks and kind of occupancy slash utilization? That's, I think that's what, where Crystal is headed in this. <clears throat> Yeah, I could say, um, I did mention earlier that we do the <coughs> facility management uh, system, and I'm not uh, putting the plug in for this uh, system called FM Systems, but this is the system we use. If anybody's doing research and come across uh, any of these systems and have any questions, we, you know, we do encourage you to reach out to us. We'd be more than willing to share our experiences, uh, as well as some statement of works, and, and even sit on some of your panels if you need. And just, just a quick note on that from a um, DHS perspective on the utilization, we're, we're really focusing on um, utilization, getting information around that. Um, Rob could speak to this better than us, but what we are trying to do is leverage that CXO type of approach. We know that our IT folks have lots of information. Our HR folks have a lot of information. Um, we are definitely conscious of security risk requirements and um, um, 
privacy concerns, et cetera, but we are working with those folks to be able to get the information that exists. So typically if you bring a laptop, you go into a DHS facility, the IT folks know you're there. Um, that pings into data world and we are working with them to essentially get that and that we can tell every single day um, how many people are actually going into those facilities. Plus you got our security folks that have PAC systems plus GSA, you guys have information. So we're looking at it from a mosaic approach, um, but really trying to figure out what is the most effective solution. Is it, are we gonna spend half a million dollars to put in turnstiles or just talk with IT folks and use that? So there's definitely a balance between um, there and that, again, it's not an easy answer uh, for there either, but there's multiple things that we're um, working on. Well, thank you, David. Um, this wraps our panel discussion for today. There's, gosh, so much more that we all could share with you all. Um, really appreciate you uh, spending time with us today and, and engaged in, in, in this really important topic. Um, we, GSA is also excited to being uh, partnering with you all as you um, uh, evolve in the realm of workplace. Um, it's been terrific kind of partnering with you all and bringing um, our best practices and lessons learned to you all, but we learn just as much from you all as you learn from us. So um, you've given us a lot to think about, and I would encourage folks um, in the audience uh, today, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to the panel. Um, they can uh, probably give you even more uh, kind of war stories about their transformation and, and the way to, to go. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, so this concludes today's uh, PBS customer forum. And we will be returning tomorrow with two sessions. We'll be starting tomorrow, first thing at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern time. And that session will discuss um, the PBS workplace resources, the emerging and customer services and solutions. And that is followed by EBSE Essentials, which will explore procuring electric vehicles, installing charging stations and utility considerations. So we've got a pretty full agenda for two sessions tomorrow and we look forward to seeing you then. And again, we thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you tomorrow. So take care. Bye-bye. Okay.